Hi there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now our program today is all about connections between people and wildlife, between fish and forest, and how we all love food. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, bright baking as part of a winter comfort menu. And how salmon help feed BC forests. But first, exploring the bonds formed between wolves, wolf dogs, and three BC residents. I remember from a young age being so drawn to wolves. I've always enjoyed wolves as a, as a child. You're watching part of a trailer of Part of the Pack. This is a new documentary that tells the story of three BC residents who have a close relationship with wolves or wolf dogs. Well, Isabel Grock wrote and co-directed this film. It's screening now at the Vancouver International Studio Theatre, coming soon to the Victoria Film Festival as well. Isabel, hello and welcome back to our Vancouver. Hello, Gloria. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. What is the appeal or the mystique of wolves that attracted you? Ah, well, it all started with a personal uh, story, a personal experience. Uh, a few years ago, I was in Vancouver Island. I was um, researching a, a book on sea otters, uh, and I was taking photographs, and we were camping by the shoreline. And then I saw, we saw this coastal wolf, which was an incredible surprise. You don't expect to see a wolf out there. I've never seen a wolf in the wild before. So it was a magical experience. And um, these coastal wolves there were there because our camp was by the shoreline. So as coastal wolves, what they do is that they feed on what the sea brings them. And so they were just passing by our camp. And that uh, encounter was very peaceful. We, we did our own thing as humans there in this camp. And the wolves just looked at us briefly and then left. So it was um, an intriguing encounter. And then I, I got me uh, interested in the story of uh, humans encountering wolves. And it was not so long after that. And also for me, it was magical because here I was researching this book on sea otters. Sea otters are a keystone species, they influence the landscape. And wolves are also landscape influences. They're also keystone species on the environment. So for me to see both of these species right there on this landscape was really very, very special. So, well, but when you say wolves, like we go back to uh, fairy tales where wolves are the big bad wolf, that, that type of thing. Are they as as dark and, and menacing as, as some think? For you're right. For all these years, wolves and centuries, even wolves have uh, always had this uh, bad reputation. They're dangerous. They're out there to to get you and kill people. And it's actually not the case. Wolves and other predators, like bears, for example, when they are in the environment, they actually do not seek out humans. There are no reason for them to seek out humans unless you're there in their environment, they perceive you as a threat or a disturbance, mm. or if you're, as a human, change something in their environment that they perceive as a threat. So that might change their behavior as well. And when you think of an environment where um, wolves today with natural habits are shrinking, um, we're changing the environment, and wolves today have more and more, they have to coexist with humans on the landscapes. So the film is about this uh, evolving relationships of uh, peoples and wolves and how we coexist on the landscape. So who do we meet in, in your documentary? So we follow three people that who love wolves, and those three characters have developed a unique relationship with, with wolves. One of them is a conservation photographer, 
Cheryl Alexander, who has had the opportunity to photograph and document the life of a lone wolf, Takaya, that came to live on a small island of Victoria. Mm. The second uh, story we follow is one of uh, uh, Gary Allen, who uh, uh, presents himself as a wolf educator and who has uh, several wolf dogs, and one of them a wolf dog named Tundra that he's been taking to schools to educate uh, people about the importance of wolves in the ecosystem. And so we follow his story of having this wolf uh, literally in his living room and what are the implications of having a, a wolf dog living with you. And then the third story is one of uh, Samantha Law. Sam is a woman who lives in Vancouver who has always had a fascination for wolves uh, uh, since she was a child. And she also gets a wolf dog and starts living, living with that animal, not realizing uh, the consequences of uh, having in a domesticated uh, environment at home in Vancouver, an animal that is part wolf, part wild, and part dog. So what do you think after this research and this project? How close do you think we should be getting to these animals? It, it is the, the question we really wanted to explore in the film very deeply. What is our responsibility? Because uh, animals like wolves, but also other wildlife species, coyotes, raccoons, cougars, bears, black bears or grizzly bears, they live today in, in environments that are more and more, uh, that are shrinking, where humans are everywhere in the landscape. So they've learned to adapt to this environment. They navigate these landscapes that are full of people. They travel through these corridors where they're likely to meet more and more people along the way. And so they, they've adapted to that. And I'm always very surprised to see how wolves and other predators really find ways to coexist and do their things in these spaces, which is extremely interesting. For example, black bears have become very nocturnal to avoid people. So our responsibility is, uh, as we're on those shared landscapes, how can we give more spaces to these predators and keep our distance so we, we give them a chance to, to remain wild while keeping our own connection to nature alive. That's a, that's a dilemma. I see. And, and in working on this project, what, what surprised you most about wolves? What surprised me most about wolves when we got to film them in, in the wild is how vast their territory is. Mm. And to find them to require for us a lot of patience and, uh, and waiting time just for a chance of a, of a glimpse of these, of these animals. And, uh, and that made me realize that how much space they need and, and sadly how much little space we leave for them to, to roam. And yet, they are very adaptable. They've really learned to, to negotiate and navigate these, uh, these new normal, these new landscapes where there are people and more people, and they do that incredibly well. So it gave me a lot to think about, a lot of respect for the wolves, but also made me think about how can we adapt as well and give space as well to these animals. Nice. Isabel, I'm always fascinated in all of the, the facets of, of nature and wildlife that you bring our way. What, a, what an incredible project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. Hi, my name's Kelsey, and you're watching Our Vancouver. All right, it's time for one of our favorite parts of the program. This is where we get to showcase a number of the photographs sent in by you. We'll start with this one from Norm Stack. He's been sending wildlife images to us for years. Here's a coyote found on a walk in Richmond just last week. So spry, beautiful. Norm, thank you. And Siler Kleisen shows us why the place is called Sun Peaks, a sunrise that takes your breath away. Thank you. And finally, Amanda Nelson was one of the many people who attended Vancouver's Chinatown Parade to mark the Year of the Rabbit. That was such a great event. Excellent dragon there, Amanda. Love it. And do send us more. It's easy. Just email your favorite shots to us at bcphotos at cbc.ca. All one word, bcphotos at cbc.ca. Now, did you know that salmon help BC's trees grow taller? Yeah, this winter season, CBC's Connell Bradwell and Emily Robertson spent time observing BC streams to see how, even after they've died, 
salmon continue to help the forest and its wildlife to thrive. Hello everyone, my name is Connell and I'm a wildlife conservationist. And my name is Emily and I'm a filmmaker. And today we are at a very chilly salmon stream, chatting all about why salmon are so important to the wider ecosystem. Now it might be the end of the salmon run, but it's certainly not the end of the salmon story. So we're gonna go set up the camera gear over by the stream and see what wildlife we can find. This is a pretty special place for me to be able to come and film. The Salmon Run's actually one of the first natural phenomenons that I was able to come and see when I moved to BC, and I've really never seen anything like it. It's amazing to think that these fish, just a few months ago, were out in the Pacific Ocean, where they've lived for years, avoiding the predators out there, before using the Earth's magnetic field and their sense of smell to get back to the same river they were born in. The salmon are here to lay and fertilize their eggs before completing their life cycle and dying. You can see the salmon scattered throughout the forest and the stream. But this really isn't a sad thing. It's actually really amazing. They've made it against all the odds to make it back to the river to complete their life cycle. This is an ongoing process throughout the winter that changes from week to week. As you can see, we're really just left with a few stragglers. We're here in late December and I'm surprised to see just how many salmon are still swimming upstream. You can kind of already see behind me how many birds the salmon run actually brings into the stream. If you come here in the summer or the spring, you won't see anywhere near as many gulls as you do here in the fall and winter. The gulls flock to the salmon streams from all over the coast, and you can see them feeding on the salmon behind me. It's a vital part of how they survive over the winter. And as usual with gulls, it's chaos. We've been seeing squabbles and disagreements and uh, just general drama. <laughs> I'm so excited because I've just seen one of my favorite birds, the Dipper. This is North America's only aquatic songbird. It's been really remarkable to see them coming in and out of the stream and singing away on the bank whilst grabbing and eating those salmon eggs. Dippers are found right along the salmon streams and they'll be here the entire winter. So on cold days like today, it's really important that they're able to have a reliable food source. And this is exactly what the salmon provide for them. So whilst we're talking about birds, it's really cool because even non-aquatic species of birds are relying on the salmon run. All these dead salmon attract insects, which are food for a variety of songbirds, and we've been seeing quite a few of them flitting around today. Even today, when the salmon run is, is finished, the birds are still able to utilize them. Here I found a carcass that has clearly been eaten by a larger predator of some sort. Around here we have eagles, bears, now we haven't seen anything today, but they're definitely here. During the actual salmon run, these predators are gorging on the salmon. Bears pack on the pounds in order to make it through the winter. It's this predation that drives what we are seeing now, the fertilization of the forest. So how do they do it? When a predator like a bear, an eagle, even a gull catch their salmon, they often move it away from the stream and into the forest. As they move it through the forest, bits drop off. They'll then usually find an area where they'll feed on the salmon, but they only eat certain parts of it and leave most of the carcass behind. So with multiple predators doing this multiple times throughout the day, that's a lot of salmon that's being moved from the stream to the forest. So why is that significant? Well, in each salmon, there are vital nutrients from the ocean, such as nitrogen. This is then released when the salmon decompose into the soil, and that's good for the forest itself. Those nutrients that Connell was just talking about fertilize the soil here in the forest. And that's really good for the trees so they can grow giant, like this one. The giant trees we see here on Vancouver Island can grow so large partly because of the salmon. In areas with healthy salmon streams, trees grow larger and faster than those without. It's remarkable because we find the same nutrients from the salmon in the trees as well as in the fur of the bears. It really shows the interconnectivity of the whole ecosystem. It's important that we have these trees growing at max capacity because not only do they in turn provide homes for wildlife, they also pull carbon from the atmosphere. Helping reduce the greenhouse gases that contribute to climate change. The cycle continues because these trees even help the salmon. Their canopies shade the streams and absorb excessive rainfall. These help prevent flash floods and mudslides from wiping out the salmon-filled creeks. How cool is that? 
Now the decomposing salmon that Emily was talking about, which are taken in by the trees, also are taken in by these native plants, which provide the undergrowth of the forest. This is good for a whole variety of wildlife as both food and shelter. There's very few parts of this forest where the salmon are not having a positive impact. Salmon run really is a magical thing and it's ongoing throughout the year and it's a key reason why we have so much biodiversity here in coastal British Columbia. I've had a blast being here filming. We have seen so much wildlife and that's really just the tip of the iceberg. It's been the best but for now we're gonna go warm up because it is freezing today. Okay we'll see you later. Thanks for watching. Coming up, a traditional story used to teach people on Haida Gwaii about the weather. It's a long kind of cool story that we tell. Um, and it gets people kind of interested in listening, right? And and I think by doing that, you you're you're especially with a young brain that you're trying to teach how to navigate through Haida Gwaii. Our weather patterns here are largely dictated by the relationship between a north wind and a south wind, or not. So a north wind would would bring you a high pressure system, sunny days um, in the winter, very cold days. Uh, with the wind kind of brushing over Alaska and coming down here. And North Wind's son um, asked North, he, say, he says that he wants to marry Southeast Wind's uh, daughter, who is named uh, the Oyster Catcher. And we all, you know, if you live on the coast, you might have heard or seen Oyster Catchers. When you go and you ask for her hand in marriage from, from Southeast Wind and, and uh, Voice the catcher's mother, uh, just be cautious. He says, go out uh, to a point that faces southeast. And when you look out to the horizon, which is kind of where we're looking now, it's kind of hard to see. I might be able to move it and get a little bit of horizon in there. When you go out and look to the horizon, it might be a beautiful sunny day. You know, I've, I've created this high pressure system, a beautiful sunny day. But when you look to the horizon from a, from a point that would look out to the southeast, and you look at the face in the morning, you look at the face of Southeast Wind, if it displays as like a, a black strip, or a bl he says if, his, if Southeast Wind's face is black, don't go to him. Um, you wait till his face is clear, and that's probably a good time to go ask his daughter's hand in marriage. North Wind's uh, son does wait for that day. He goes out to a point, and he sits and waits for that for Southeast Wind's face to to clear up and be just ocean and sky. Then he goes out to him and he, and he does ask for his hand, or his uh, Southeast Wind's daughter's hand in marriage. And uh, they, they do approve of it. They approve of the couple. You're, you're creating this beautiful story that they're likely going to remember, much, much like how we remember the cat in the hat and or, you know, other stories like that, um, they're going to remember, and they're going to remember the scenes that, that took place. And if they remember even just one thing from that, like if you're sitting on a point and you're looking out to the southeast, then it might look like a calm day, it, uh, but southeast winds face is, is, is black with the red over the horizon. Um, it's likely not a good day to choose to go out of an adventure. Johanna, thank you so much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. It is winter menu time in our city's restaurants, and there are so many great examples of inventive dishes. Just you wait, because Five Sales at Canada Place has desserts that bring some warmth and sunshine to a cold day. And pastry chef Daria Andrienko is here to tell us more about that. Daria, hi, welcome. Hi, thank you, Gloria. Thank you for having me here. I'm so excited to be I'm so With intrigued you, by yeah. what you brought in today, but how did you get into being a pastry chef in the first place? Well, honestly, like I finished my education as a graphic designer and I never finished any pastry school, but I 
fell in love with a pastry a long time ago. I've been cooking with my mom, with my grandma. And uh, I started doing pastry and that's it, I'm here. No turning back. Yeah, no, no turning, turning back. back. Yeah. Okay, and you're originally from Ukraine? I'm from Ukraine, yeah. And you've, how long have you been in, in Canada? I moved to Canada about four years ago. Okay, and yeah. we all know what's going on in Ukraine right yeah. now and our, our hearts go out to, to everyone there. How, how's your family? My family is safe. My mom is doing good. Yeah, it's a tough situation there, but I hope that things will be over yes. soon and, you know, they will be in peace. We hope so, too. Peace. We yeah. hope so, too, and I'm really glad to hear that, that, that they are safe. But you have brought some incredibly inventive um, desserts for us here. Where do you want to start? So I will start with our signature dish. That's the dessert people coming back to try over and over again. Uh, so this is our apple made it out of vanilla mousse, uh, apple compo, sable breton, and it's finished with a creme anglaise. Okay. So it show me, show me what so you, how you would serve this. <gasps> usually we have a smoke, so it comes with a smoke covered. Right. People can see anything under the dome. It's an experience. Yeah, it's not so just a dessert. They intrigue, right? Yes. So then we put in creme anglaise all over the apple. That's gorgeous. And that's how we serve. Well, first of all, okay, I have to take a bite. May yeah, I? Yeah, definitely. Okay, I'm picking it up. So we get, but first of all, that it isn't even, it looks like a green apple. That just looks like a green apple and you can't see the creme anglaise there. Yeah, so just you can just tap it. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's yeah. got like the actual, it's like a little candy apple on the outside a little bit. Look at how that, I've got to get a smaller bite. With the creme anglaise? With the creme anglaise, right? My goodness. How long does it take you to put one of these together? Honestly, it takes a while. Sometimes it takes three to four days. Mm. It's such a long process, mm. very complex, mm. with a lot of baking, freezing, mm. making, shaping, glazing. Now, that is, it's kind of custardy on the inside, yeah. too. That is absolutely gorgeous. And the creme anglaise doesn't take anything away. Just a really lovely, soft yeah. Yeah. compliment. Thank you. Well, that's a great place to start. A green apple that's not a green apple. Um, where do you want to go from yeah, here? Yeah, so the next one, it's actually uh, the honey cake, my grandma's recipe, but oh. I made it in my own way. My grandma used to have a bee farm, and mm -hmm. we always had a lot of honey at home. Wow! So that's where I take my inspiration from. I add a lot of honey elements with bee pollen. There is a uh, honeycomb twill. The sheets made it out of the caramelized honey and sour cream and honey cream. Now, I'm not surprised that you talked about your background in graphic yeah. design. Yeah. Like there is something I so... I love to visualize gorgeous. my desserts yeah. first. It's gorgeous. So where would I take, where would be so the best place So you can just to... go with the cream. Yeah, just right take here? a little bit of cream, yeah, and bite of honey cake. So the cream is sea buckthorn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the orange berry full of vitamin C. Mm. You're trying to tell me this is good for me? Yeah, good this is very healthy as well, you know? <laughs> And it's good for you, too. That is absolutely gorgeous. It's very subtle, very soft, and I just love these little touches. So what is this actual, looks like a little bee yeah, so, honeycomb. Yeah, so we have a mold, mm. but mm. the twill made out of the honey mm -hmm. and the burnt butter, icing sugar, egg whites, yeah. Gorgeous work. Like, you. like you're a little bit of a chemist, a little bit of a graphic designer. Yeah, a little, a little bit, bit of everything. everything. How exciting. Okay, now what about this one that looks like a flower over here? So that's our new feature spring dessert. Mm -hmm. uh, the dessert made it out of the rose and raspberry yes. compo and has a rose infused cream and uh, dark chocolate petals. So you actually Come have on. to... This Spray is... a little bit of rose water. Seriously. So it also smells like a rose. Put it to your nose. Yeah. It smells like a rose. That is gorgeous. Okay, and is that just, you just is that? Yeah, you just, you just go in. Just, <laughs> no, just go in. <laughs> so, no, no. This is the best way to start the day, I've got to say. Just, just go yeah, in. Yeah, just go in. Mm. Yeah, have a little mm. bit of middle. What that, okay, yeah. is there something else going on? Yeah, oh, I see oh. what you mean. Okay, look at this. That's when you get to that. So the compo really made it gorgeous. with the rose water. I add mm. a little bit of rose petals, mm. fresh raspberries, and uh, raspberry but that's gel. Soft, that soft rose flavor. And you know yeah. what? It's so special to eat something that you can tell has had a lot of thought and energy put into it, too. It just You don't want to gobble that down, is my point. Yeah. You want to just take your time with it. Wow, this is such a treat here. And I'm intrigued by this bowl of oranges. What is so this one? that will be... That's our new... That's the, the pièce de résistance? Yeah. Is this the, okay. <laughs> that's the end of the dinner. Uh, that's our new dessert. Okay. I had this idea 
few years ago, but I never had a chance to make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a cold bowl. That's a very yeah, cold bowl. Yeah, that's a cold bowl. There's a lot of dry ice around. Okay. So we're gonna put our dessert. So this is actually a dessert. It's not a mandarin. On the middle, have okay, some oranges around. These are actually. Ooh. Uh, oranges around, and yeah. this is the dessert and that you've created. And it's got all the modeling of the. Okay. Yeah. So how we serve, we cover this with a cloche, wow. and then we have a orange punch. It has a lot of. Oh, it's warm. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's mm, that smells so beautiful and, and fresh. We pour. Oh my. All oh my. The way around. So I Daria. add a little bit of orange scent. This and is the sponge. Yes, I can, I'm getting that coming out as well. Yeah. Now that is just amazing. Now I I don't Thank I don't you. even know if we go to five sales for dinner. We just go for five so, courses you know, of dessert. Some, some people are actually coming just to have a dessert. <laughs> Not surprised. <laughs> so seriously, I can take a bite yeah, of you this. Can, yeah. Like this is an actual orange this is here. Orange. But this one. Yeah. Again, you do. <gasps> Look at that. So Inside is a, a mandarin compo. Yes. Caramel is chocolate cream, and on the bottom is a dark chocolate crust. If you insist, I'll give this one a try too. Yeah. This is just beautiful. Mmm. I love the freshness. I love the freshness. You know what? You are an artist on, on so many levels here, and thank you for bringing some, some sunshine thank into the studio much. today. It was my pleasure to we'll, meet you. We'll see you yeah. at the five sales. Thank you. Beautiful, wow. If you'd like to go and see some live music, the rock band Imagine Dragons, they're going to be at Rogers Arena January 30th. And Toronto's Lights plays the Commodore February 1st. Hi, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. And it keeps happening. More and more Canadian artists, both young and not so young, are finding massive breakout success or careers reborn through TikTok, the video sharing social media app that burst onto the scene about six years ago. And it's become a real boon for musicians. Here's a song that went from a bedroom in BC's Fraser Valley to TikTok to number one on the Billboard Alternative chart. Going back to 2020, that is one of the biggest TikTok hits to ever come out of Canada. It's by Pao Fu, AKA Isaiah Faber, a 21 year old from Mission BC. He sampled a UK pop track and wrote and performed his original lo-fi rapping over top and named the tune Deathbed. Then he uploaded it to YouTube. The song crossed over to TikTok and just exploded. Pao Fu is now signed to Columbia Records and Deathbed has become a worldwide hit going platinum and gold in several countries. Older Canadian artists have also seen big career upswings thanks to TikTok. In recent years, Vancouver band Mother Mother's 2008 song, Hayloft, went viral and it sent their career straight up, especially in the States. Sean Desmond, the R&B singer who was once called Canada's answer to Justin Timberlake, had hits on the radio 20 years ago. But thanks to TikTok, Sean is back and performing to packed venues. So too is this artist, known as the queen of Canadian R&B. Going back to 2007, that's Julie Black with her awesome throwback soul hit, Seven Day Fool. And Julie is no fool. She hadn't released an album since 2015, but jumped on TikTok a couple years ago and has found a new audience and a career resurgence. But possibly one of the biggest names to go viral out of Canada recently is an Ottawa artist called Talk, T-A-L-K. Like many of these artists, he's not new to the music scene. He has more than 10 years of experience in touring bands, but it wasn't until he released his bedroom pop song, Runaway to Mars, 
that his career went into the stratosphere. This song connected with listeners in a huge way. And in early 2021, Talk was performing concerts to three people. By the end of 2022, he was performing to crowds of more than 70,000. What if I run away to Mars? Would you find me in the stars? That's Talk from Ottawa with his out of this world hit, Run Away to Mars, which he recently performed on the James Corden show. Talk will also be involved in a new project called the CBC Music Playlist Challenge, which I'll share with you soon. I'm Grant Lawrence, and Run Away to Mars is the song that you need to add to your new music playlist for this week. I'll check in with you again soon. Coming up, getting creative with ramen recipes. A Vancouver chef brings new ideas into the traditional dish. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, if you live in Vancouver, chances are you've probably eaten at a ramen restaurant. With hundreds of traditional and contemporary styles, this seemingly simple dish harbors immense creative potential. And one local chef is tapping into that. My name is Carlo Bueno. I am the chef owner of the Ramen Club. I'm from Whistler originally, and then I moved here to Vancouver five years ago uh, to learn about ramen. <laughs> Soy sauce seasoning. I didn't have a career or anything. I didn't have a direction in life. I decided to work at a ramen shop so I can eat ramen for free. Boils for two minutes. That's when the obsession began. There's five components in a ramen. There's soup, there's noodles, there's seasoning, aroma oil, and toppings. And there's no rule with what you can do with these five things. There's hundreds of different regional styles, and I also like to create my own style. During the pandemic, I started selling ramen kits just to test if my ramen is good enough. Then after that, I started doing pop-ups until I found this place. I'm sharing a kitchen with Bao Down. When customers arrive, they get two menus, one from Bao Down and one from me. So our specialty is, uh, it's called Chintan or clear soup. It is different from the mainstream ramen here in Vancouver. Uh, so the big shops, they have tonkotsu, which is the creamy, rich pork broth, uh, or the tori pai tan, which is the chicken version of that. We wanted to serve something that is not seen very often in Vancouver, which is the clear broth. We have soy sauce base, doing styles that are not well known. Uh, people are really up to it. And so I think the uh, uncommon styles will become more popular in the future. I love everything about my job. I eat ramen every day. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cherry. We come watch our Vancouver. Mmm, ramen is comfort food, that's for sure. But the cost of all food these days has been anything but comfortable. Grocery prices have soared over the last year in BC and across Canada. And CBC's Joel Ballard joins us now with an in-depth look at some of the ways Canadians are getting creative to cut costs. If you've been to the grocery store lately, then you know. The cost of food just keeps climbing and climbing, with the typical bill for a family of four expected to jump by more than $1,000 in 2023. So, I wanted to know how people here in BC are coping and what creative ways they've found to deal with the high prices. I personally save thousands of dollars a year in, in groceries by just um, going online and using different apps. First three rows last year were high trellises of Romano beans, which looked really beautiful and were super productive. And I also wanted to understand what these rising costs mean for their lives in the long term and how we might fix this 
for good. I'm in Surrey outside of a grocery store where we're about to meet this no-nonsense grandma named Erin Schultz. Now in her house, she has six mouths that she has to feed. She has her daughter, her four grandchildren, and she's come up with a genius way to save hundreds of dollars when she goes grocery shopping. And so how have you noticed that the rising cost of food over the last year has impacted your family? Basically everything for kids, especially school snacks, things like that, I notice never go on sale anymore. It's items that used to be $1.99, two for five are now, you know, three, three fifty, four dollars $4 each. Cost of produce is, is absolutely outrageous. Um, and I think that the more processed foods uh, is almost a cheaper way to go. Have you had to change how you shop, the way you shop, what you shop for? Well, I don't ever pay full price for anything, uh, ever, no matter how, how badly we want it. Um, and I just basically took to the internet and started researching ways of saving money. Erin uses an app that collects all the flyers from local stores. She finds the cheapest price for products, then goes shopping at a store that offers price matching. I personally save thousands of dollars a year in, in groceries by just um, going online and using different apps. Should we shop? Let's shop. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we bought the exact same eight items. Mine at regular price cost $36.48 total. What were you able to, what was your total? $22.85 on eight items. And eight items, and eight items, I can imagine, for a house of six people. This is, this is not a normal yeah, shop. No. What do you think about the fact that we're now in this place, in this country, where you have to figure something like this out, where you have to find an app that can help you save hundreds on your groceries because the price of food is so high? It's terrifying. It's terrifying. I mean, you, you think of, you think of, you know, this kids in school, what are they, what are they eating? You know, what, what are your parents having to get a second job to, to be able to put fresh produce? I mean, a head of lettuce is over $6 right now. A simple head of lettuce is $6. That's, that's ridiculous. As food insecurity grows across Canada, it's forcing people to adapt, not just on a personal level, but also a community level. Hey, I'm Joel. We grow food in the community, by the community, and for the community. When COVID happened, a lot of our programs shut down, and then we began to think, well, okay, uh, we need to pivot and, and begin to look, think about what services we're providing. And so out of that uh, came the Yard Garden Harvest Project. The program's still in its infancy, but here's how it works. Last season, five different neighbors volunteered their lawns, and more than 1,200 pounds of fresh produce was grown. Now, this lawn might not look like much right now, but at the height of the growing season, it produces food like broccoli, cherry tomatoes, gailan, garlic, all this produce that is then used for food security programs. When I think about it, I think there are so many yards in Vancouver, there are so many yards in Metro Vancouver. This is a model that different communities can be uh, uh, replicating. I think this should definitely be something expanded to as many neighborhoods and, and cities as possible because one of the really neat impacts is how it changes space and changes people's perspective on what a yard can be. It doesn't have to just be grass or you know shrubs, it can produce food. And I think that's, that's a really neat part of the project. Coming up, a jewel in Vancouver's Punjabi market has died. Thanks for joining us here for Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, a pioneer of Vancouver's Punjabi market has died after decades of serving the community. Balu Thakur's jewelry store, it was one of the first businesses to open in the area back in the 70s. Yasmin Khania has more on his legacy. He was more into this type of stuff, this type of jewelry. Balu Thacker's son says his dad's jewelry store was more than rings and bangles. Helped a lot of people in the community. He liked to see the community prosper. 
Balu laid the foundation for what is now known as the Punjabi market. He died earlier this month at the age of 84. Thakur moved to Vancouver as part of a wave of South Asian immigrants in the early 70s. His jewelry business, one of few on Main Street. I love like the longer earrings. These are called jumkas. His granddaughter says Thakur's heart of gold welcomed the South Asian community. He was very hardworking, very loving, um, very charismatic, and very good conversationalist. The store quickly became a major hub for South Asians, drawing customers from outside Vancouver, other provinces, and even the United States. And so it wasn't just, you know, buying goods, selling goods. It's just like, this is family. We're going to give you more than just a good, you know, goods exchange. It's about making sure you feel comfortable and loved and you feel appreciated as well. Experts say the pioneers of the Punjabi market carved out a space where South Asians could feel a sense of community. This was a, a safe enclave it, where people not just went for business, but they actually bought homes in the close by regions. And it became a place for us to feel that we belong. And despite the Punjabi market not being the place it once was, they have no plans to leave the area. Thakur's family will continue to run the business. Our families have built this, our community has built this, and so it's ours to take care of, it's ours to you know, push forward and to nurture. Vowing that the younger generation can keep the Punjabi market alive. Yasmin Ghanaya, CBC News, Vancouver. Yasmin, thank you so much for that lovely tribute. So we are staying in the world of retail for our trip back in time now. Back in 1985, Hacky Sack, it came to Canada, starting here on the West Coast. What's going on here? The 1985 version of Frisbee, Hacky Sack. Now, keep your eye on that bouncing ball. The idea is to keep it up in the air with as much style as possible. In the fine weather, pick up Hacky Sack games happen all over the city. Hacky Sack is a brand name. The generic word is foot bag, and there's all kinds of them on the market. This crocheted one is called a granny bag, and the black one with the studs is for punkers. There's also a book about foot bag, and there's even a regular magazine which tells you about competitions where you can win up to $10,000 in prize money. Now, some players are very good. These two fellows are former Frisbee champions who've turned Hacky Sack crazy. It is very challenging to be able to uh, use both your feet. But for example, most people when they start, they, they're only going to use one, one of their feet. There's, it's as if one part of their body is totally lame. They'll, they'll hop around one foot, kicking with their right foot. But the object is to be able to, to flow gracefully uh, around the sack. Of course, it takes a lot of practice to get graceful, as these two new players are finding out. It's great because you get a whole bunch of people together. You can play with any amount of people that you want. And you just have a good time, play it anywhere. Well, are there any rules? Uh, you're not allowed to use your hands, and you're not allowed to say you're sorry because uh, everybody makes mistakes. <laughs> Nobody wins at Hacky Sack, but clearly competition isn't the appeal. It's very sociable because when you play it in a group, it doesn't matter if it falls to the ground. It's, it's just very, I think it's a real social, sociable, fun activity. It's no surprise that Hacky Sack got started on the laid back west coast, but it is spreading. By next summer, the little bouncing ball could be the biggest thing on your block. For Midday, I'm Ann Petrie in Vancouver. Now at the end of this program, we like to tip our hats to our talented photojournalists on staff here at CBC Vancouver. They bring us images in their artful ways to give depth and character to the stories that we cover. So here's a sampling from what they saw this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, bye-bye.